Radio Blues Maki is the name of the band from New York City. It's a really uncanny blend of uh, Japanese kind of soul singing or enka singing and uh, an American R&B and, and jazz mixed in. And they're the perfect band really to kick off this evening, which, uh, you guys can go up, which is uh, called Monkey Business Cabaret or Japan Night 2. My name is Roland Keltz and I'm a writer who uh, pretty much lives half of each year, I'm oh, sorry, half of each year in uh, New York and half in Tokyo. Uh, and I'm the author of a book called Japan America. So in some ways as a half Japanese American, I was uniquely positioned to get involved in this project, which is Monkey Business, New Writing from Japan. This is the English language edition of an acclaimed Japanese literary journal founded by uh, Motoyuki Shibata in Japan. The English edition got kicked off a few years ago, and this is the third issue uh, that we're able to bring out to you. You should have received a copy when you walked in the door tonight, and we very much hope you enjoy it. Um, roughly four years ago, uh, Moto and Ted, uh, the founders of the English edition, asked me if I could help them find a way to get this publication out in the United States. And um, as someone going back and forth, I contacted my friends at a public space literary journal, which is based in Brooklyn, New York. And um, Bridget Hughes, in particular, the founder of that publication, became very excited about the opportunity to bring contemporary and traditional Japanese literature out in an annual English language publication. Uh, four years later, here we are with issue three. We have uh, writers here from Japan who are going to be reading to you tonight. We also have uh, some writers from the States who are here. And I'm going to turn it over now to the founders of Monkey Business, Motoyuki Shibata and Ted Goosen. Thank you. Um, it's good to be back here. Uh, we did it last year as well. And uh, like, la like last year, we apologize for the lack of symmetry. <laughs> it's not something you can amend in a year. Well, I am shrinking, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I think we're getting more symmetrical. And, uh, well, I'm not growing. <laughs> anyway, so uh, tonight we have uh, a variety of readings. Uh, we are very proud of this new issue of Monkey Business. It, uh, Monkey Business has been growing. If you look at the, th the thickness of the three issues, each one is bigger uh, than the last. And as well, the range of literature in it is expanding. Okay. Um, we are giving a very brief reading from uh, uh, the stories by two authors. Uh, the first one is Jean. Mm -hmm. Are you reading? Yeah, okay. Okay, so. <coughs> so this is the, uh, the first work uh, in uh, the issue. It's called Exercising Dreams. Uh, it's written by Keita Jin and translated by Paul Warren. And I'm just going to read the first few lines. Whereas pleasant dreams enter the body through orifices such as the ears and nose, bad dreams are said to come in through the anus and work their way from there to the brain. This, I was told, accounts for the fact that the bizarre visions we experience as dreams come upon us only at night. Dreams lie in wait until we are asleep, then, seizing their moment, they invade our bodies from the outside. And now, Jin is a young writer who made his debut in this magazine, Monkey Business. And when we first received this submission, we were um, puzzled because his name is Jin, and uh, there can be a number of characters you can use for the name Jin. And the one he used uh, signified God. And he claimed to live in a city called Abashiri, which in Japan has an unfortunate uh, association. Everyone thinks of the, of the big prison that's there, that's in that city. So it's like, uh, you know, you're an editor and you get submission from uh, somebody who calls himself God who lives in Sinsen. So 
and the submission was extremely good. So I thought uh, some established writer was uh, pulling our leg, but uh, he was really young uh, psychiatrist, and uh, his first uh, submission uh, publication came out in this magazine. Now we are reading the uh, sort of uh, opposite example. Yeah, the second uh, selection we're going to uh, re uh, read for you, Moto's going to read it, uh, is by a writer named Taki Momma. And she was 76, I believe, uh, when she submitted her first work, and this is her first work, to Monkey Business. And in the four or five years since she wrote it, uh, she's continued writing. So she is an example of, I guess, what we could call Roji Bungaku, or uh, senior citizen literature. And given the growth of the population of senior citizens in Japan, and increasingly here as well, and the fact that they form a, a possible uh, a body of readers, and that they have the time and the interest in reading stuff that's related to their situations, I think this is a, a, a work of a very new and important sort. It's called Splinters. We decided to have tea at the restaurant that sat in the shade of a grove of trees. When we had chosen what we wanted, we called the waiter over. I had told my daughters that water would be fine to go with my custard with caramel sauce, but what, when the waiter asked, what would you like to drink, dear? I answered, all right then, coffee please. Mom, my older daughter said after the waiters left, you tell us what is all you want, but when the hot waiter asks you, you change your mind and order coffee. My granddaughter giggled. Enjoy the rest of the story in your, in your car. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll be back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we're going to have a reading of modern Tanka poetry by Mina Ishikawa. Uh, these poems were translated uh, by both uh, Moto and, and myself. So actually, I'll act as interpreter and you be the reader. So okay. uh, we, we are staying after all. Mina <laughs> Ishikawa. <laughs> uh, I create tanka, which is a traditional Japanese form of poetry. Tanka Tanka is a form of poetry that consists of 31 syllables, 57577. Perhaps haiku, which is a sort of younger brother of tanka, is more uh, is well known, is better known. Sorry. Haiku is five, seven, five, syllables. Haiku is made up of uh, five, seven, five syllables. So tanka is slightly longer than uh, seven, seven, fourteen syllables. The pieces I'm reading now are from a, from a collection of tanka I wrote, which is called uh, Monogatari Shu, a tale of uh, tales in tanka. It's an art collection in which every piece of tanka ends with the word hanashi, a tale. And as an as interpret, interpreter, let me say, in English translation, the word tale comes at the top at, uh, instead of at the tail. <laughs> <laughs> この短歌というのは31音しかない。この短歌というのは31音しかなくてとても短いのですが、その一種の短歌が大きな物語の断片であったり、あるいは物語全体を包み込むような、そういうふうに大きなものとして響くことが、私の人から願いであります。This is hard. It is my secret hope that my, uh, my uh, little tanka can contain a fragment of a big story or even a whole story. この物語集はもともとはあのカードの形で作ったもので、一つのカードに 
1個の単価が印刷されてシャッフルしてどこから読んでもいいようにそういう仕組みになっていました。Initially, I made this collection not in the book form, but in the form of cards. On, on each piece of card was printed one piece of tanka. So you can sort of shuffle them like a playing card and、uh, in, read in the order, you know, any way you like. So t h e r e are Rodok Chimas Monogatari Shu Tales and Tanka. Tales and Tanka. Tabeso Koneta Rutia Shio Mo. ヤマンバが涙の沼を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たちの涙を作った話。私たちは、私たち免許証に記載されたる住所から遠く離れて語れる話銀縁の眼鏡をかけて二人行く悪の道華やかなる話人生の真実を語る話乱闘が始まるまでの2時間に700ページ費やす話 A tale which spends 700 pages on the two hours before the brawl began. A tale of a life lost seven times on the quest for missing words. A tale about a desert where a child with a hole in his throat walks wheezing. A tale about the dreadful teeth of a maniacal baseball manager so ravenous he devoured his players. In, in Japan, if there is a baseball manager who is particularly、uh, scary to his players, he's called an oni or a demon manager. <laughs> the tale of six people meeting in a lobby at 2 a.m. Five lacking shadows. のぞきたる鏡の中に夜が来て、ヤマンバとカス、娘の話。The tale of a young girl who turned into a mountain witch when the night rose in her mirror. 発射時刻を5分ほど過ぎておりますが、車掌が語る、ヒレンの話。A tale in which a conductor announces, although our departure is five minutes behind schedule, and launches into a tale of tragic love. あの日本では電車が送れると必ず発車時刻を5分ほど過ぎておりますがもう少しお待ちくださいというようなアナウンスが流れます。In Japan, when your train is, is late,、uh, the conductor comes on to the uh, uh, and announces on the intercom that、uh, you're going to be delayed for some period, but he never goes into stories of, of tragic love action. <laughs> その通り<笑>。朦朧と口に運びし伸び棒があなたの指に変わるまでの話。A tale in which the wild grapes I absentmindedly pop into my mouth become your finger. 体中にココア塗られて、替えたてのシーツ一枚ダメにする話。A tale where a fresh sheet is ruined when someone smears your body with cocoa. 輪郭の見る間に薄れ消えゆくをきしっとだけども消えたる話。A tale in which his outline faded fast, and though I held him tight, he disappeared. コーヒーを初めて見たるババ様が、毒じゃ毒じゃと暴れる話。A tale in which Granny sees coffee for the first time and makes a terrible scene, shouting, It's poison, goddamn you!
おとぎ話の亡き村にしてイノシシの子供も十匹似て食う話。A tale of ten boar babies boiled and eaten in a village without fairy tales. Jokan got Hitori Jimesta Kampano, Yamio ni Magire, Nusumidas Hanashi. A tale in which soldiers steal biscuits commandeered by their officers under cover of darkness. Korea Watashi no Sofu no Jitai Ken de Watashi wa Choksetsu wa Kite Nai desu ga. あの祖父が戦争に行った話を母が聞いて母が私に話してくれたことです of, of mother, who, uh, 眠る犬の静かな夢を横切りて世界を覆う翼の話。みぞれ味と聞いて書いてある飴玉が吹雪味とは困った話。Tale of being annoyed when the snowball cookies you bought taste like blizzard balls。霊長類最後の夕べ、沸騰する空を見ている老婆の話。A tale of a hag gazing at the seething sky on the primate's final evening. 瞬く間に手足が生えて本という本が地球を逃げ出す話。A tale in which every last book abruptly sprouts arms and legs and flees planet Earth. 陸と陸静かに離れ、その後は同じ文明を抱かざる話。A tale where two continents quietly separate and cease to share a common civilization. 手袋をしまうシーンの美しくそこばかり読み返した話。A tale containing a beautiful passage about gloves put away that I keep reading over and over again. ヤマンバの元を逃れし若者が地雷にて足を失う話。A tale about a young man who flees from a mountain witch only to trip a landmine and lose his leg. 大空が間違えました<笑>大空に雲が記して行きたれど真偽のほどはわからぬ話。A tale of questionable veracity written by a cloud across a sweep of sky. 大空に雲が記して行きたれど真偽のほどはわからぬ話。A tale of questionable veracity written by a cloud across a sweep of sky. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we are having the American writer, Mr. Kevin Brockmeyer. Thank you all for being here. I'm here largely because、uh, Mina reviewed a collection of mine、uh, that was published in Japan. And、uh, when she was asked if there was an American writer she'd like to meet and be paired up with, she offered my name.、Um, so I'm grateful to Mina、uh, as well as to Penn, Monkey Business, and a public space for inviting me here tonight.、Um, the story I'd like to read is from a collection called The View from the Seventh Layer. And it's called A Fable with Slips of White Paper Spilling from the Pockets. Once there was a man who happened to buy God's overcoat. He was rummaging through a thrift store when he found it hanging on a rack by the fire exit, nestled between a birch colored fisherman's sweater and a cotton blazer with a suede patch on one of the elbows. Though the sleeves were a bit too long for him, And one of the buttons was cracked. The coat fit him well across the chest and shoulders, lending him a regal look that brought a pleased yet diffident smile to his face. So the man took it to the register and paid for it. He was walking home when he discovered a slip of paper in one of the pockets. 
An old receipt, he thought, or maybe a to-do list forgotten by the coat's previous owner. But when he took it out, he found a curious note typed across the front. Please help me figure out what to do about Albert. The man wondered who had written the note and whether, in fact, that person had figured out what to do about Albert. But not, it must be said, for very long. After he got home, he folded the slip of paper into quarters and dropped it in the ceramic dish where he kept his breath mints and his car keys. It might never have crossed his mind again had his fingers not fallen upon two more slips of paper in the coat's pocket while he was riding the elevator up to his office the next morning. One read, don't let my nerves get the better of me this afternoon. And the other, I'm asking you with all humility to keep that boy away from my daughter. The man shut himself in his office and went through the coat pocket by pocket. It had five compartments altogether, two front flap pockets, each of which lay over an angled hand warmer pocket with the fleece almost completely worn away as well as a small inside pocket above the left breast. He rooted through them one by one until he was sure they were completely empty, uncovering seven more slips of paper. The messages typed across the front all seemed to be wishes or requests of one sort or another. Please let my mom know I love her. I'll never touch another cigarette as long as I live if you'll just make the lump go away. Give me back the joy I used to know. There was a tone of quiet intimacy to the notes, a starkness, an open-hearted pleading that seemed familiar to the man from somewhere. Prayers, he realized. That's what they were, prayers. But where on earth did they come from? He was lining them up along the edge of his desk when Isley, from technical support, rapped on the door to remind him about the 10 o'clock meeting. Half an hour of coffee and spreadsheet displays, he said. Should be relatively painless. And he winked, firing an imaginary pistol at his head. As soon as Isley left, the man felt the prickle of an obscure instinct and checked the pockets of his coat again. He found a slip of paper reading, the only thing I'm asking is that you give my Cindy another few years. Cindy was Isley's cat, familiar to everyone in the office from his Christmas cards and his online photo diary. A simple coincidence? Somehow he didn't think so. For the rest of the day, the man kept the coat close at hand, draping it over his arm when he was inside and wearing it buttoned to the collar when he was out. By the time he locked his office for the night, he believed he had come to understand how it worked. The coat was, or seemed to be, a repository for prayers. Not unerringly, but often enough, when the man passed somebody on the street or stepped into a crowded room, he would tuck his hands into the coat's pockets and feel the thin, flexed form of a slip of paper brushing his fingers. He took a meeting with one of the interns from the marketing division and afterward discovered a note that read, please, oh please, keep me from embarrassing myself. He grazed the arm of a man who was muttering obscenities, his feet planted flat on the sidewalk, and a few seconds later found a note that read, why do you do it? Why can't you stop torturing me? That afternoon, on his way out, he was standing by the bank of elevators next to the waiting room when he came upon yet another prayer. All I want, just this once, is for somebody to tell me how pretty I look today. He glanced around. The only person he could see was Jenna, the receptionist, who was sitting behind the front desk with her purse in her lap and her fingers covering her lips. He stepped up to her and said, by the way, that new girl from supplies was right. Right about what? I heard her talking about you in the break room. 
She was saying how pretty you look today. She was right. That's a beautiful dress you're wearing. The brightness in her face was like the reflection of the sun in a pool of water. You could toss a stone in and watch it fracture into a thousand pieces, throwing off sparks as it gathered itself back together. So that was one prayer, and the man could answer it. But what was he to do with all the others? In the weeks that followed, he found thousands upon thousands more. Prayers for comfort and prayers for wealth. Prayers for love and prayers for good fortune. It seemed that at any one time, half the people in the city were likely to be praying. Some of them were praying for things he could understand even if he could not provide them. Like the waitress who wanted some graceful way to back out of her wedding. Or the UPS driver who asked for a single night of unbroken sleep. While some were praying for things he could not even understand. Let the voice choose lunch this time. Either Amy Susson or Amy Goodale. Nothing less than 30%. He walked past a ring of elementary school students playing Duck, Duck, Goose and collected a dozen notes reading, Pick Me, Pick Me, <laughs> along with one that read, I wish you would kill Matthew Brantman. <laughs> he went to a one-man show at the repertory theater, sitting directly next to the stage, and afterward found a handful of notes that contained nothing but the lines the actor had spoken. He made the mistake of wearing the coat to a baseball game and had to leave at the top of the second inning when slips of white paper began spilling from his pockets like confetti. Soon, the man realized that he was able to detect the pressure of an incoming prayer before it even arrived. The space around him would take on a certain elasticity, and he would know, suddenly and without question, that someone was offering his yearning up to the air. It was like the invisible resistance he remembered feeling when he tried to bring the common poles of two magnets together. The sensation was unmistakable. And it seemed that the stronger the force of the prayer, the greater the distance it was able to travel. There were prayers that he received only when he skimmed directly up against another person. But there were others that had the power to find him even when he was walking alone through the empty soccer field in the middle of the park, his footsteps setting little riffles of birds into motion. He wondered whether the prayers were something he had always subconsciously felt, he and everyone else in the world, stirring around between their bodies like invisible eddies, but which none of them had ever had the acuity to recognize for what they were or whether he was able to perceive them only because he had happened to find the overcoat in the thrift store. He just didn't know. At first, when the man had realized what the coat could do, he had indulged in the kind of fantasies that used to fill his daydreams as a child. He would turn himself into the benevolent stranger, answering people's wishes without ever revealing himself to them. Or he would use the pockets to read people's fortunes somehow. He hadn't yet figured out the details. Or he would be the mysterious, slightly menacing figure who would take people by the shoulder, lock gazes with them, and say, I can tell what you've been thinking. But it was not long before he gave up on those ideas. There were so many prayers. There was so much longing in the world. And in the face of it all, he began to feel helpless. One night, the man had a dream that he was walking by a hotel swimming pool, beneath a sky the same lambent blue as the water, when he recognized God spread out like a convalescent in one of the hotel's deck chairs. You, the man said, what are you doing here? I have your coat, don't you want it back? God set his magazine down on his lap, folding one of the corners over, and shook his head. It's yours now. They're all yours now. I don't want the responsibility anymore. But don't you understand, the man said to him. We need you down here. 
How could you just abandon us? And God answered, I came to understand the limitations of my character. It was shortly after two in the morning when the man woke up. In the moonlight, he could see the laundry hamper, the clay bowl, and the dozens of cardboard boxes that covered the floor of his bedroom. All of them filled with slips of white paper he could not bear to throw away. The next day, he decided to place an ad in the classified pages. Purchased at thrift store, one overcoat, sable brown with chestnut buttons, pockets warm, possibly of sentimental value, wish to return to original owner. He allowed the ad to run for a full two weeks, going so far as to pin copies of it to the bulletin boards of several nearby churches, but he did not receive an answer. Nor, it must be said, had he honestly expected to. The coat belonged to him now. It had changed him into someone he had never expected to be. He found it hard to imagine turning back to the life he used to know, a life in which he saw people everywhere he went, in which he looked into their faces and even spoke to them, but was only able to guess at what lay in their souls. One Saturday, he took a train to the city's pedestrian mall. It was a mild day, the first gleam of spring after a long and frigid winter. And though he did not really need the coat, he had grown so used to wearing it that he put it on without a second thought. The pedestrian mall was not far from the airport, and as he arrived, he watched a low plane passing overhead, dipping through the lee waves above the river. A handful of notes appeared in his pockets. Please don't let us fall. Please keep us from going down. Let this be the one that makes the pain go away. The shops, restaurants, and street cafes along the pavement were quiet at first. But as the afternoon took hold, more and more people arrived. The man was walking down a set of steps toward the center of the square when he discovered a prayer that read, let someone speak to me this time, anyone, anyone at all, or else. The prayer was a powerful one, is taut as a steel cord in the air. It appeared to be coming from the woman sitting on the edge of the dry fountain, her feet raking two straight lines in the leaves. The man sat down beside her and asked, or else what? She did not seem surprised to hear him raise the question, or else, she said quietly. He could tell by the soreness in her voice that she was about to cry, or else. He took her by the hand. Come on, why don't I buy you some coffee? He led her to the coffee house, hanging his coat over the back of a chair and listening to her talk. And before long, he had little question what the or else was. She seemed so disconsolate, so terribly isolated. He insisted she spend the rest of the afternoon with him. He took her to see the wooden boxes that were on display at a small art gallery, and then the Victorian lamps in the front room of an antique store. A movie was playing at the bargain theater, a comedy, and he bought a pair of tickets for it. And after it was finished, the two of them settled down to dinner at a Chinese restaurant. Finally, they picked up a bag of freshly roasted pecans from a pushcart down by the river. By then, the sun was falling, and the woman seemed in better spirits. He made her promise to call him the next time she needed someone to talk to. I will, she said tucking her chin into the collar of her shirt like a little girl. Though he wanted to believe her, he wondered as he rode the train home if he would ever hear from her again. It was the next morning before he realized his overcoat was missing. He went to the lost and found counter at the train station, and when he was told that no one had turned it in, traveled back to the pedestrian mall to retrace his steps. He remembered draping the coat over his chair at the coffee house, 
but none of the baristas there had seen it. Nor had the manager of the movie theater, nor had the owner of the art gallery. The man searched for it in every shop along the square, but without success. That evening, as he unlocked the door of his house, he knew that the coat had fallen out of his hands for good. It was already plain to him how much he was going to miss it. It had brought him little ease, that was true, but it had made his life incomparably richer, and he was not sure what he was going to do without it. We are none of us so delicate as we think, though, and over the next few days, as a dozen new accounts came across his desk at work, the sharpness of his loss faded. He no longer experienced the compulsion to hunt through his pockets all the time. He stopped feeling as though he had made some terrible mistake. Eventually, he was left with only a small ache in the back of his mind, no larger than a pebble, and a lingering sensitivity to the currents of hope and longing that flowed through the air. And at Peng Lin's Chinese restaurant, a new sign soon appeared in the window. Custom fortune cookies made nightly and on the premises. The diners at the restaurant found the fortune cookies brittle and tasteless, but the messages inside were unlike any they had ever seen. And before long, they developed a reputation for their peculiarity and their singular wisdom. Crack open one of the cookies at Pang Lin's, it was said, and you never knew what fortune you might find inside. Please let the test be canceled. Thy will be done, but I could really use a woman right about now. <laughs> Why would you do something like this to me? Why? Oh, make me happy. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, sorry. I need spectacles for this. Uh, in the first place, uh, I must apologize to you for oh, I'm not good at English especially in pronunciation like this. <laughs> if you can't catch my words, please imagine or apply your favorite word. <laughs> I think that would be better than correct word. <laughs> now, I'm going to read a short piece titled Demon Seas. Uh, the leading character is a man uh, who a uh, name? Tanaka. <laughs> Mr. Tanaka, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, who just got out of prison, uh, and I suppose uh, he'd been in prison for a long, long time uh, because of unwritten crime. He looked for work and tried to find the place uh, to accept him, but he couldn't answer. At last, he reached a office, a modern, gorgeous, and swanky office, where a few eccentric young men manage. They deal with something about a body reconstruction or body mo modification, and they themselves reconstruct their body. First one. Uh, first one's tongue is split in two. Ooh. Another one, uh, she's a girl. She extended her tongue. <laughs> and the last one, here we go. Wait. Yeah. Tanaka was silent. He didn't want to see something else. He didn't want to see anything. Tanaka didn't come back out into the world 
to witness such things. He simply wanted to work. He was even willing to dig that yes. The last thing he wanted to see was a split tongue. Ken, come here for a sec. The man called to someone as he pushed the button on the table. The back door opened, and in came a large man with a grin on his face. The man gave the impression of a lump of mindless mass. He had piercing dangling not only from his ears, lips, and nose, but from his entire face. Ken, show me, Mr. Tanaka, what you've got. Still grinning, Ken pulled down his pants. Tanaka screamed, or rather tried to scream, yet no sound emerged. Tanaka just sat there, pitifully, his lips trembling. What happened to his dick? His dick is split in two. Oh, mama, what's wrong with these people? What happened to the world while I was in the prison? <laughs> Ken has undergone something called genital splitting. Think of it as a kind of enhanced urethotomy. <laughs> An incision is made in the penis from the base to the top, causing a clean split. They say it's quite painful. Yeah. <laughs> the breathing is heavy. Did you know the nerves of the penis are concentrated in the upper half, which is probably why it hurts so much. The surgery has also been known to cause erectile dysfunction. <laughs> which means there is a risk. But if it goes well, you will have in your hand two fully functioning penises. <laughs> so what do you say, Tanaka? Are you wrapping your head around all this, around the awesomeness of it all? The man and Ken exchanged knowing glances and smiled. But Tanaka didn't notice. By this point, Tanaka was barely listening. Oh, mama, these peeps are insane. <laughs> Absolutely bone find insane. One of our most popular items today is a penile sub-incision. Basically, it's an incision to the underside of the penis. There are two types of it, and short sub-incision, where you can only the bottom part of the glands penis is a perineal favorite. Think of it as a kind of congenital hypospadias. <laughs> In most cases, the patient performs it on himself. To do it, you just clamp the incision area with a hemostat. But you've got to clamp it slowly. There's no pain at all if you use EMLA or some other local anesthetic. And you don't need to be a doctor to get EMLA. The drug is even a popular item at sex shops in the US. But it's harder to get in Japan, which is why we are trying to import it privately through our site. Anyway, once you've removed the hemostat, the incision area is now paper thin. It's a simple procedure, and it feels much better than inserting a silicon ball or something into, or oh, at any rate, Mr. Tanaka. That's a long and short of it. This may all come as a bit of a shock at first, but I want you to understand what it is we are trying to import to Japan. 
namely body modification all better yet body reconstruction the altering of your body according to a preferred image customers contact us through our site we provide the information and eventually they provide us with new information and images and then we publish it we receive the payment which is set at a fixed rate this is already a booming industry in the u.s <laughs> people into the staff have a few places to go our site is at once a hospital a temple and a convenient store or rapidly one. There are just some legal issues to clear first. After all, we are walking a fine line between legality and illegality. I've also heard rumors that the Yakuza are plotting to penetrate that industry and that the location of our site is being tracked. This line of business is no cakewalk, nor is it entirely safe. But it is, after all, a growing industry. You getting all this, Mr. Tanaka? I'm sorry, may I use the restroom? <laughs> This was all Tanaka could master to say. He hobbled to his feet. He felt right in the head. His nausea persisted. He entered the restroom and urinated. He looked at his penis. It was not yet split. <laughs> Computers were installed even in the restroom. The screen was explaining some kind of sight. A video was playing too. Click here for information regarding leg removal. Leg removal is a form of lamp amputation. Please proceed to the next window. You may now retrieve our video footage of a leg removal. Amen lay on an operating table. His face was covered with a cloth. One of his legs was missing. A chunk of flesh from his remaining side had been lopped off. And the white bone lay exposed. A surgeon began to cut into the bone with something like a saw until eventually the entire leg dropped to the floor with a sad. Tanaka left the restroom and returned to the office. Ken was lying down naked on the desk. His penis was furiously erect. Mary Ann took turns licking with her long tongue the two penises that crossed at a 15 degree angle. Her tongue looked like a snake curled in the branches of a tree. The man with a digital camera turned to Tanaka and winking, said, here, take over the filming for a bit. I'm going to join. Just hold it steady like this. Tanaka walked toward the desk. He took out a knife from his duffel bag. Then, in a single swift motion, he slid the knife along the man's jaw. Blood gushed from his jaw as water from a ruptured pipe. His throat had been split open right down the side. The man appeared unable to comprehend what was happening. He looked as if he was about to say, come now, enough with the jokes. 
Yet he did look bewildered. Then, just like that, the man toppled over. At such time, the thought processes of a man cease altogether. Ken and Meriam dumbly stared at Tanaka as he approached them, smiling, knife in hand. Tanaka grabbed hold of Ken's penis, both penises. Then, with great ease, he locked them off. What? 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 Forming at the mouth, Ken began to weep. Tanaka now turned toward Mary Ann, who stood there frozen, jamming his fingers into her mouth. Tanaka gave her tongue a brisk tap and slit the knife sideways across it. Oh, Mama, these people are demon beasts. No sane person could ever do what they do. Just think what the world would come to if such demon beasts got their way. Don't you see, Mom? These peeps are trying to turn the world on its head. It's like what the doctors say, you know. The shrink who was in charge of me in prison. You are not a bad man. You are not an animal. You are not evil. Something just came over you at the moment. A kind of veil was laid over your eyes. You had no choice in the matter. That's what he told me. Mom, and he was right too. I'm sure we. How else could I have slit yours and daddy's throat? That wasn't me who did that, Mom. That wasn't my deed. That was a deed of some demon beast I don't even know. Which is why I must see to it that such demon beasts never again roam the earth. You understand me, don't you, man? Tanaka took hold of the still wailing Ken's hair and, placing the knife behind his jaw, drew it slowly. The blade cut through the muscles and tendons and he could feel it arrive at the bone, putting his weight into it. Tanaka continued to sew back and forth. He felt it cut through the bone. Then he let go of the hair. The head dropped to the floor. Now just one more to go. Tanaka turned toward Mary Ann. Her face wore an uncanny expression. This was not the expression of any human. At least, that's what Tanaka thought. This is the expression of a demon beast. Suddenly, everything came into focus. The veil had been lifted. Tanaka grabbed Mary Ann's hair. It was like grabbing the hair of a dog. This time, there was altogether no resistance. That's all. Thank you. We, uh, thank you. <laughs> We have a, a, a closing reading here, a very special uh, reading from uh, Motoyuki Shibata. And we have some live music to close you out this evening from the Susan. And they'll be setting up as uh, Shibata-san reads. So Motoyuki Shibata.
No, uh, I'm actually just saying a few words uh, while the band is uh, uh, pre preparing. Um, I have been told that uh, uh, completely unfounded rumor has been circulating about this event that Haruki Murakam is coming to this place. <laughs> and I'm sorry to let you down. I heartily wish it were true, but he isn't coming. <laughs> um, as a small consolation, uh, let me tell you a piece of news that uh, his new novel has come out in Japan last month, and it's a wonderful book. And uh, the title is uh, The Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki and His Years of Pilgrimage. And this afternoon, I took a moment uh, translating the very first paragraph. So Ted is going to read it. Okay, so this is the first paragraph from the colorless Tsukuru Tazaki and his years of pilgrimage. From July of his sophomore year in college to January of the following year, Tsukuru Tazaki spent his days constantly thinking about dying. His birthday came and went during those six months, but that milestone didn't have any particular significance. In those days, terminating his own life seemed to him the most natural, reasonable thing to do in the world. Why he didn't take the final plunge is still a mystery to him. Back then, crossing over the threshold that divides life and death was easier than swallowing a raw egg. So you can, uh, I think you probably have to wait a year or so, don't you think, for this, yeah, this to come uh, out in English? Please look forward to uh, Philip Gabriel's translation, but he's, he's fast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't, even though we don't have uh, any piece by Haruki in the latest issue, which came, to the, came with the ticket, uh, we do have a long interview with Haruki in the first issue and a short essay by him in the second issue. Uh, so if you are interested, please uh, go to the, uh, Ron, what's the name of the uh, uh, Tumblr? Tumblr, yes, yeah. this, uh, New Writing from Japan. New Writing from Japan. That's where you can buy the uh, first and second issues. And uh, incidentally, in the second issue, uh, we have the whole collection of Mina's tail in Tanka, uh, she uh, read part of it today. And uh, also in the third issue uh, you have now uh, contains another story by Mr. Takahashi uh, called uh, uh, Dear Cindy. And are we, am I missing something else? Anything else? Well, I think uh, we have other events uh, connected to this launch. Uh, we have one at Book Court, which is tomorrow night, I believe, uh, in, in, uh, on Court Street in Brooklyn. And there will be copies of the first and the second issue available for you then. And there's also going to be an event on Saturday at the Asia Society on Park Avenue uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I believe, which is also part of the Penn Festival. So in both cases, uh, you could uh, pick up the uh, copies of the first and second issue. And also, uh, especially at, uh, at the Asia Society, there are dialogues with the two writers who you heard tonight. Uh, with uh, uh, Takahashi-san will be talking with Paul Oster and uh, um, uh, Mina will be uh, talking with Charles Simic, so it's uh, going to be quite uh, an event. Okay, I think uh, the band is about ready and they're going to play us out to the end. So thank you all very much for coming and we enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello, we are the Susan from Tokyo. Thanks for coming tonight.
next song is about our hometown, Tokyo. Yeah, it's a very new song. Tokyo uh, performing for us tonight, although now based in Brooklyn. Thank you very much, all of you. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you again for coming out tonight. You heard um, from Neo Blues Maki, uh, from Motoyuki Shibata and Ted Gusen, uh, from Mina Ishikawa, Kevin Brockmeyer, uh, Yanichiro Takahashi, uh, Shibata again channeling Murakami. Thank you very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed the evening. I'm Roland Kelts. Thanks a lot.